Welcome back to the Looney Hour, episode seven, uh, Turkey Week here. We've got uh, to the left, our favorite boomer, as always, Keith Dicker, looking sexy as hell in his black shirt. Uh, welcome back to the show, Keith. And we got uh, our good pal, Richard Diaz with Acorn. Um, he's traveling on the road, but uh, took, taking one out for, for the loyal audience here. So appreciate uh, both you guys jumping on the show here for Turkey Week. We've got, uh, you know, a whole bunch of topics to, to cover on this week. Uh, we want to touch on, first and foremost, some updates from the Bank of Canada, real estate investing, uh, talking about price controls. Keith's got some conspiracy theories. Uh, and of course, we'll talk about uh, Turkey, not only the Turkey, but uh, the Turkey as in the currency, um, which we touched on last week. So we've got an update there as well. Um but I wanted to touch first and foremost on uh, kind of lead out this conversation. We had a report out from the Bank of Canada. Uh, they were basically coming out and saying that all these investors were piling into the housing market and they were leading the number of um, purchasing activity in the housing market. And they were essentially blaming invest- investors saying that they were creating you know, systemic risk or heightened risks in the housing market. Um, which again, I found kind of hilarious because if you go back to Tiff Macklem's speech in July of 2020, just after the onset of the pandemic, just, you know, fresh off $5 billion a month of quantitative easing, zero interest rates. Uh, he said one thing, which is that his message was clear to Canadians that he was going to keep interest rates pinned to the floor until well into 2023. Uh, and that he was basically he basically was pounding the table, demanding Canadians go out and borrow money, businesses go out and borrow money, and that would drive investment and consumption. And of course, you know, lo and behold, you know, since that speech, national home prices are up twenty eight percent since his speech in July, which is the fastest pace on record. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if you got any comments there. That that speech came from uh, Lawrence Shremby. Uh, Keith, I know that uh, you and him had a little powwow back in the day, which uh, you probably can't share on this podcast. But uh, you care to care to comment <laughs> on on which one? Uh, your your buddy Lawrence and or his uh, his his <laughs> disdain for <laughs> his disdain yeah. for real estate investors. Yeah. So we'll, we'll comment on the on the former. How's that? Um, you, you know what, like, as you said, Steve, they, you know, the bank of Canada gave everyone a go to, to take on risky assets again. That that's what, that's what central banks do. You know, it, it's kind of like the, uh, think of the army, you know, they have a sledgehammer in the CIA or like, you know, individual guys that could go like Tom Cruise and those guys and the born identity guy, they Frog go man. inside the house. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the central bank, they have one tool that it, it's a hammer. So they, you know, they, they slammed it, um, and, you know, they're down hard on the catapult and, you know, money went flying through the air. And so they gave everyone a, a go to, to do stuff with. So, uh, you know, households and individuals would use that to buy real estate or to lever up on the real estate. Um, some Keith, re- you bought I a new car, right? I didn't know. I, I have no. a, uh, a fancy I, new I, mic. I, with this Serb a, check. I know, but I have a boomer. I have a boomer car. <laughs> my car is. Um, but, you know, I remember back in those days, I was chatting with one of, one of, the, one of the larger firms in Canada that they w- we would all know. And, um, you know, so the, my, my guy there, he was saying, he said, Keith, you wouldn't believe how quickly we changed direction. We just like, just like that, we went from scouring the world to focus on this part of the world to do something to they immediately retrenched, you know, they, they cut off lines they had to, and then just went full on in this other direction because they knew they had free money to, to go do with it. And uh, so, yeah, so if the Bank of Canada, I think they're being a bit, you know, disingenuous, uh, you know, for them to say it's not their fault that the housing market went up, um, I, I don't think that's quite fair for them. It's kind of like, remember in, in, in college days, you know, you go to the, uh, we used to have a, the, the engineering bash on Friday nights or something. And it was, you know, it was pretty inexpensive to have some fun. And, uh, you know, a lot of the kids had too much fun, but, you know, it, it wasn't the, the organizer of the bash. It wasn't their fault that that, that happened. No, so of course not. Kind of like, yeah, of course not. What about you, Rich? What, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I just think it's, um, I think it's a pattern 
And I think we're seeing more and more of it. So I'll just give you three or four examples. Um, Elizabeth Warren, just to bring it to the US a little bit, talking about, you know, big oil trying to gouge people. Um, Joe Biden releasing strategic petroleum reserves, basically literally a drop in the bucket and complaining about high oil prices. And I'll bring this home to Canada. Um, you have, you know, <laughs> Elizabeth Warren again talking about big, big turkey and how big prices turkey. are really high. And in Canada, you have you know, people complaining about um, how there's two, there's a housing shortage. Um, and each for each of these different instances, you see that governments act. Um, it, they think they're doing the right thing. They think they're doing the politically expedient thing. And when the and then when people like us say raise their hand and go, hey, maybe that's such not such a good idea. Well, ahead of time, let's be very clear. This is not a Monday morning quarterbacking. Um, you see the examples of how things go wrong and then they which are wholly predictable, whether it's in Canada, you know, having the highest immigration levels in 35 years, and then people wondering why there aren't enough houses, um, lowering interest rates and blowing out the budget deficits. Let's be clear, those budget deficits were four standard deviations away from the mean, um, almost twice that of what happened in 2008. And then wondering why there's inflation and then worse, blaming global factors, which of course are part of it, but really just absolving any responsibility. In America, they've been trying to put the squeeze on oil producers, domestic oil producers, um, and, and, and basic, and, you know, trying to screw with supply chains for years. And then when things go bad, they go, oh, it's the, it's the, it's the boogeyman. It's the market's fault. It's the market's fault. When in reality, I mean, a lot of these things, number one, to me, should have been very, very, were, excuse me, very obvious from the beginning, especially the oil thing especially, and in your world, Steve, the real estate, um, you know, the real estate problems we're having. So I think it's just a pattern. I think it's, it's really kind of a shameful, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, Steve, I mean, Keith, you're way too nice. You say it's disingenuous. I think it's malicious. I think it's, it's, I think it's, um, it's an ideology that trumps practicality and pragmatism. And I think it's really frustrating for people who are like me, who just want to be centrist and pragmatic and who are time and time again, who are shown these policies that sound good on paper and everybody seems to like on the face value. And then when the experts or the analysts or the market strategists like us say, hey, you know, it's probably not such a good idea that you screw with pipelines because it sounds good. Um, and when things blow up and things go bad, as the, you know, these same politicians are the first to turn around and blame market nefarious market actors. And so, you know, I just think it's, it's just a pattern. I think we're going to see more and more of it until we get some kind of cleansing of that attitude where, um, where the government is, you know, it can do no, can do no wrong. And everything that goes wrong is the market's fault. And I think it's just wrong. I think it's, 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 um, like I said, I think I'm, I'm much more cynical about it. Um, Keith and, and for real estate and Steve will touch on that in a second. It's, it's much, much more obvious. And um, it's a real shame, actually. I think Canadians are being misled and, and, and I think it's for us to, to, to point it out and to say it's, it's not right. And it should change. Rich, you're going to get canceled with that kind of verbiage. <laughs> Keith did warn us, but I think I think I towed the line just not, neat enough. Yeah, uh, Keith, Keith's always warning us. He's like the uh, he's he's the he's the father in this he's, relationship. It's good, yeah, exactly. He's the daddy o trying to keep keep the duck keeps his baby ducks in line. But you know, if we can't, if, I think Canada is meant to be relatively free, and, and I, I don't think I cross the line. I think it's just for all of us. I mean, you know, we talk, we say that we're markets guy. I think what we are is. We're, we're not just markets guys, we're, we're, I think we're humble in our inability to predict the future and to really appreciate the kind of second order and third order effects of our actions. And I think that the governments right now, they're clearly displaying and showing us that they don't really think about those second order effects. And I think that's, I think for me, that's a really big, big bugbear. I would never speak to, for you guys though. <laughs> just, yeah, let me, like all... just let me add, yeah, let me just add to that. Cause if you touched on a really good point, Rich. Um, I think if everyone stepped back, so that, you know, the story I'll tell now, you know, we had interest rates in, I think, 1982, they hit 20%. So if you had a GIC, you're maybe getting 15%, your mortgage was probably running 25% or something like that. And, and then, you know, we, we just had about a 40 year period where rates went from 20% down to zero. That's where we are. So we're now, we, we've hit this and they call it the lower bound or zero bound and, and all that. But we've hit this 10 year period now where the financial structure and system and how we do everything, it's, it's changing underneath their feet. But because people, they're, they're not told this story, the, the big Canadian banks certainly don't talk about it in, in, the, in the way they should be. 
but we we are changing it, it is happening it is a market force a market reaction to it and policymakers they're they're trying to prevent this from happening as, as much as they can so that's why they're doing all, all these funny things and the more they do it and, and the more they talk about it and the more the big media you know they they, they allow it as well and they soften and the language behind it um people are just unaware this dramatic shift that is happening and 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 that's that's what's happening underneath our feet so to have zero and negative rates and qe and you know everyone being bailed out and housing markets going up you know 20 percent in one year that is not normal that is not how markets work and 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 that's why I think you know it's it's a really good conversation that we're having all the time now. We're making more people aware of it. Things are going to change, and when they change, they change abruptly, which sort of leads into Turkey, which of course we'll get we'll get into in a little bit. Yeah, but like I know I can be a bit soft with it sometimes, but um, it, again, maybe I'm being too soft. We are getting a, a dramatic shift here in the financial market, uh, whether that's in interest rate markets, lending markets. Uh, credit markets, which we'll talk about as well, but things are changing, guys. And for people who can't see it happening, you know, they'll they'll be blindsided by it, but they shouldn't be because the, the, the you know the the message is wide, wide and, and loud. Keith, I think you, um, I think yeah, I think you, you you brought home like a good point, right? Because I think at the end of the day, you were talking about low interest rates, negative rates, these you know twenty percent price growth. Not that's not normal. It's not supposed to be happening in the housing market. Um, and I feel like, yeah, is there some sort of, because when I look at like the housing market here in Canada, these guys have tried everything other than obviously raising rates. Um, you know, they've tried in 2000. So for example, Vancouver and Toronto are basically the majority of the housing grow. So, you know, here specifically, you tried a foreign buyer's tax. Uh, you then brought in in 2017, OSFI brought in a mortgage stress test. Then they brought in uh, here in Vancouver, brought an empty homes tax. Then we banned Airbnbs. Um, then we increased the foreign buyers tax. We have nationally uh, and in Vancouver, we got record uh, new home completions. Um, these guys have tried everything. Except to raise <laughs> and, for interest rates. Except for except raising the most interest rates. Except the most important lever. The, and, and everyone goes, oh, well, that doesn't make that much sense. In 2018 in Vancouver, I think I already mentioned this on the show once, in 2018, uh, when mortgage rates went to 3.5% and everybody thought they were going to 4%, and this is just before the, the stock market tanked in December of 2018, um, when Powell says he was going to raise rates you know, no matter what, mortgage rates at 3.5% that year, and... Vancouver home sales fell to a 30 year low for the entire year of 2018 and home prices dropped about 10%. And that was just in 12 months. Um, so anyways, long, long story short is I think that the, the price and the cost of money is probably the most important variable. So coming full circle back to uh, your buddy Lawrence there at the bank of Canada, uh, I think he is probably to blame, but um We've seen thoughts. this before, which what's so frustrating for me, sorry, one tiny mini tangent, I promise we can move on. What's so frustrating for me is that how painfully obvious it is. And I'll give you an example of the euro area. In the euro area in 2004, 5, 6, 8, in the run up, you know, you had two basically quasi, you know, not such great economies, Ireland and Spain had massive real estate bubbles and people say well why and it's like yeah there was some foreign inflows but largely it was a function of having massively negative real interest rates sustained for a long long time and the germans turned around and when it all went bust when when you know inflation tanked and there was deflation and real interest rates soared and people couldn't cover their mortgages and the housing bubble popped the germans turned around and looked down the side of their nose and said oh you know they were just profligate and they were reckless Fast forward to 2014, guess who now has negative real interest rates? Germany does. And guess what happened to the Berlin housing market? Guess what happened to housing market all over Germany? For after almost 20 years of no, no price rises in Germany, you had massive increases in housing prices year over year all over the shop. And, and lo and behold, you give a country a negative, massively negative real interest rate. And I'll show you a housing bubble. You know, people in some ways are really stupid. In some ways, people are really smart. If you if they can figure out that they can get paid to borrow, they're going to do it. 
And so in Canada, look, look what happens 10 years ago. I've showed the chart before, and I guess I'll have to show the chart again. You have negative real interest rates in Canada, sustained well below inflation, and lo and behold, house prices absolutely rip. And so the idea that we couldn't have figured it out, we couldn't have predicted it, I just find it just baffling to me. So that's my last piece on that. Yes. It's so very frustrating. No, I, I mean, I, I think you've summed it up well. And just, just to sort of last touches on this, but um, now the, the regulator... I just find it interesting because obviously big media here in Canada never discusses, you know, monetary policy and if it's the correct, you know, or, or the responsible actor for, for high house prices here. Never question, you know, uh, the, the, the man upstairs there at the BOC. Um, but I did notice that, uh, you know, uh, net today actually is just scrolling through the Twitter feed. OSFI is now looking at uh, home equity lines of credit and saying, well, Canadians have really been tapping that over the last, you know, particularly the last 18 months. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's OSFI, which has long been rumored, uh, will start coming after uh, home, home equity lines of credit, those being used to actually uh, purchase uh, secondary investment properties. People have been tapping existing equity, using that as the down payment to fund, you know, second, third, fourth condo properties, et cetera. Um, so again, we'll never touch interest rates, but we will look at uh, restricting uh, home equity lines, stuff like that. So, um, but Keith, you've got um, more importantly, shifting gears, you've got a bit of a, I don't want to call it a conspiracy theory, but a, a logical theory. You're trying to get him in trouble. Uh, <laughs> we've got um, uh, Lael Brainerd uh, recently nominated at the Fed. So she's, uh, Jay Powell, of course, got, got re-upped. Uh, Brainerd uh, got promoted there. And, you know, this show has talked a lot about um, raising interest rates, normalizing interest rates, inflation. And of course, Keith, you've rightfully flagged you know the stronger us dollar of course there's been some happenings uh more recently we, t- we last week we talked about the the turkish lira uh and and the weakening or the currency crisis that was evolving there and obviously it's escalated even further uh over the past since we since we put out that podcast last week so great call on that uh but you want to update us on that sort of situation that macro call like you know what what what's your gut telling you right now yeah, a couple of things. Uh, so first of all, uh, you know, Rich made a point about, uh, I forget exactly what you said, but I, but I think I wanted him to comment was that I think it, it is incredibly easy to identify when major turning points are going to take place in a market or an economy or a system. The, the timing is always going to be difficult. But again, identifying when that you know, you're talking about the German housing market that that's what it was rich yeah. uh, but it, it, I think it is very easy when market when markets move to an extreme in any direction you're able to see that hey this is going to turn it, it may not be next month next quarter or next year but it's going to turn so you know, we shouldn't be surprised when it happens but yet everyone is always you know shocked and, and awed over it um, and then something else you said as well Steve I had a question for you talking about uh, I think foreign buyer taxes and penalties in, in the market. Like what was an example of what those rates were or are, I guess. Yeah. You see, like the government came in in 2016 here, they slapped a 15% tax on any foreign buyer purchasing, you know, Canadian or Vancouver real estate. And then like a year later in 2017, Toronto followed the exact same tax. And then a year later in 2018, the BC government, under the new uh, NDP government came in and increased that tax from 15% to 20%. So, um, and again, if you look at Vancouver and Toronto housing markets, I mean, they're, they're ripping to all time new highs, you know, every single week. So. But, but Steve, isn't it worth it? I mean, if you know your house price is going to rise 20 or 30% in two years, then what's a 15% tax? I mean, to me, that's it pays for itself, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think the ultimately is like, it's kind of like an immigration story. Like a lot of these foreign buyers aren't really like foreigners. They're like dual citizens or, you know, like- PR. Right, PR, per, PR per, status, right? So, mm-hmm. um, which is fine. I mean, we Canada needs Im- immigrants and it needs immigration. And I think that that's that's clear. I think, um, but it's just it's what you said earlier. It's that lever that no one wants to touch. But anyway, we're we're digressing. No, I was asking because you know I, I lived offshore for a number of years, and uh, you know the island I was on, you know they they had a bit of a housing problem as well in that it. Demand was always greater than supply, and a lot of the demand, you know, were from expats coming in. 
so so literally overnight um and, and that's what happens in some of these places not a long drawn out you don't throw out you know the straw man to see what the reaction will be it just it just happens overnight i remember waking up one morning and uh the the government uh decreed that um any foreign investors or non locals buying a property uh to be a 25 percent tax on that and so what it did it, it immediately leveled the playing field somewhat because a lot of the locals you know they they didn't a lot of them didn't have high paying jobs and, and stuff like that so you know all of a sudden that million dollar condo the local was paying you know now it's one and a quarter you know for the other one coming in but what they also did though because of where i live there were a lot of trusts that are set up everyone had their money set up in a trust and um, if the trust was set up in the local jurisdiction then that was deemed to be local so there, there was a huge way to get around this, you know, 25% tax. And I'm can sure I, a lot I, of people are getting around the tax out there as well. For sure. So can I, can I add one more thing? It's fun, kind of funny. It's like a great like case study. And it kind of comes full circle to what we've been talking about this entire show, which is, uh, so if you look at New Zealand, New Zealand's got, you know, a massive household debt bubble, uh, extremely high real estate prices, like basically akin to Canada and Australia. Um, and so they, I think it was like a, two years ago under like a new government, they brought in, they banned foreign ownership. So you, you can't, if you're, unless you're a New Zealand citizen, you can't buy real estate there. Uh, <laughs> and prices, prices still ripped. Um, they're still going up. They still hit all time highs throughout the pandemic here. And so then the, the government was begging the central bank, Keith, you'll like this. They were begging the uh, central bank there at New Zealand to, to, uh, put house prices uh, in, in their sort of mandate. They said, well, we want you to include house prices in terms of the overall inflation. And, 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 the, <laughs> and he said, then all my problem, we ain't doing that. Uh, <laughs> you know, cause obviously it's, it's a much more complicated topic, right? I mean, but you know, they, they did raise rates down in New Zealand this week. Yeah. Marginally. Yeah. And uh, you know, the, the, the Kiwi dollar sold off afterwards because they didn't raise them as much as what, you know, the market was, was hoping for, but it's sort of, let, let's tie that. That sort of leads into the whole, you know, the, the fed discussion yeah. that, um, that we in, introduced earlier. So, so right now around the world, the expectation is that central banks are going to turn hawkish. So what, what that means, everyone, if you turn hawkish, um, it means you're going to make money more expensive to borrow. So interest rates are going up or is less money supply going into the system or it's more difficult to get a loan and stuff like that. And th the reason you do that is to slow down the economy, which should in effect lower inflation. So that, that's the reason for it. Uh, the other term dovish, you know, you're a dove. If you want to keep rates low or zero or continue with QE and, and, and stuff like that, uh, you know, without going through the fine print, all the central banks have been doves forever. You know, that that's what they do. Uh, however, with the Fed right now, so uh, the, the Chairman Powell, he was up for renomination, and um, there are a lot of people um, in both the White House as well as Congress and Senate. They weren't quite happy with with what he's doing uh, for a number of different reasons, and the the likely person that they they had targeted to uh, succeed him, um, this lady Brainard. It was well known that she would not get through the nomination process through the Senate, so it, it would get held up. And uh, so, for that reason, by default, you have to go. Okay, we there's no one else we want to nominate, so we'll we'll stick with you know the, the lad that's, that's there now. So we, we still have power. But what they did announce was that hey, you know we're going to make a vice chair. So uh, Jerome Powell is the chair of the Federal Reserve Board. It's like a board of directors, and he's the chair. Um, but now they have uh, this lady that's now Bernard, who she's now the vice chair or the co-chair or co-head. So anyone out in, in the business world that you know, especially from the banking world, guys, uh, the moment you see the email in the morning that such and such has been a, has been a point to this, uh, you know, co-head of the banking division or co-head of asset management, you know, this is a succession program that's just been announced. We know who's going to lead next. The only question is, when does that person lead? Which then leads us into talking about how are they going to kick Powell out? Because that, that's what they want to do here. They want Powell out so Bernard can, can come in. Uh, so they, so let's, talk, let's go down that road. And um, so I have some pretty good contacts and, and networks in, in that part of the world. And, uh, you know, these guys, they, they just 
breathe politics, geopolitics all the time. And, and like, they're really deep in, into that world. And, and it is a swamp, guys. It is a 100% swamp. So you have to be a swamp creature to survive and know how it works. And um, the guys that are involved with it, they've been there a long time and, and they know it. So it, it's pretty credible narratives that you get from them. Um, so what's happening is, is, you know, you mentioned the Bank of Canada, they might change the mandate somewhat. The Federal Reserve mandate, it, it's slightly now changed as well. So in, in addition to making sure they have low inflation or are watching inflation as well as full employment, and one sort of contradicts the other, of course, but now climate change focus is, is coming into play. Uh, so we have those three now new pillars for the Federal Reserve and I mean, it's hard enough for central banks to try to control inflation, which as we know, it, yeah, they, they cannot do that at, at all. So with climate change coming on board here as well now it, as a policy, um, you know, that, that's, that's just another, you know, trying to row the boat with, with three oars, you know, now it's going to be harder. Um, however, so let, let's think about this now. We have no new fiscal spending plans coming on in the U.S. next year. So whatever budget gets passed, it's now been watered down so much. Uh, it's been diluted, it's already been priced in the markets and, and so forth. So we, we have less boost to GDP in the US next year. GDP is already slowing. And uh, with the goal of getting employment up, that's, that's gonna be a bit, a bit tricksy, you know, as, as we say. We also know now uh, over in Europe, that they're entering lockdowns all across the EU. It, it's, it's accelerating, whether you could agree or disagree with it. It's fact, it, it's happening. Uh, you know, lockdowns are not exactly positive, you know, to sustain growth in your economy. We also have China. Now, they're likely going to head into recession. So actually like two quarters with negative growth. That's what we have coming up now in, in China. At the same time, we have oil prices, which are likely shooting higher because of climate change policies that are being uh, enacted around the world. So think about this. We now have this period. Oh, on top of this, we, we now have a lot of union uh, agreements. We touched on the Cargill one up, up in uh, Alberta. Uh, John Deere, they just announced one down in the U.S. Um, what I remember they're having, I think most most employees are getting an $8,500 one-time bonus. Truckers then, as well. Uh, yeah, and, and then 20% uh, wage hike over the life of their contract. Except and, for the uh, ECB. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. We we'll talk about that as well. <laughs> But, you know, every other, you now all, all the other big unions in the U.S., you know, that they'll use that as a starting point. So now we're entering now 22. We're going to have the probability of lower economic growth coming up around the world and the U.S. Uh, we also have higher oil prices, which is going to, you know, drive inflation data higher. Uh, wage inflation is going to be higher as well. You know, you have Powell and the Fed and other central banks, they're turning hawkish. They're going to stop QE or reduce it. I mean, we might want to try to start increasing rates as well. So th this is now setting up this, uh, th you know, th this, this perfect turn in markets. And you should be able to see, because it is easy to see. And unless those conditions change that I just walked through, we're going to see a market with a continuing rising U.S. dollar. And when you get a continual rising U.S. dollar, that, that that just squeezes the life out of risky assets, which means there's a higher probability that equities come off, treasury prices can go up, and then credit price, credit bonds or corporate bond spreads are going to widen. So credit bonds will, will come down in price. So it, it's creating this, this perfect mix now to see an increase in risk or re-escalation of stress or crisis in the emerging market world which of course comes into Turkey that, you know, we we're talking about last week. So, so again, just setting the stage here that, you know, as we get towards year end, it, it's been a pretty good year for a lot of people, their portfolios uh, with everything going up in price, but we're, we're now set up for this bit of a precarious start to 22. And again, we go back to what happened uh, in, in, in Washington last week with, with the head of the, of the federal reserve and, and Powell. Rich. Yeah. So I just want to say, I just want to, I think sometimes in a way we're a bit contradictory. And so I just want to address that and sort of our mistake. Cause I think, you know, we, where we, I think a lot of us, I think Keith and I agree that interest rates have been too long, low for too long. And that's, you know, that's an issue for kind of income 
income inequality, for addressing housing bubbles, et cetera. And then on the other hand, we say, well, the Fed's going to be more hawkish going forward, and that's going to affect risk at risk assets. And I, so I think for us, for just for people who are listening, or it's the first time, I think for us, it's there's a difference in timing, and then also. If, if I, if I may, as well as um, how you perceive the actions by the Fed with respect to risk assets and where you think they're going to go in the short term. So is that, is that fair? I think that that's just a fair sort of disclaimer as far as um, how you perceive it. Um, I think the other thing that's key, I think, for other people to know and to listen to, I think the reason people might ask, well, why is the dollar going up in the U.S. going to affect emerging markets? And one way to think about it is a lot of these emerging markets borrow in dollars. And so if you raise, you can raise interest rates, which obviously affects the price of that money, or you can raise the, the, the costs um, of, let's say, paying that back. So if you're generating lots of revenues in your local currency and then paying it back, um, let's say paying some borrowing in US dollars, um, in effect, that's like almost, you could say it's like an interest rate hike, so to speak. And so that's why um, a lot of people are, and like me, I'm concerned, Keith's concerned, we have two sort of major policy levers that sort of aren't real policy levers, so to speak, which is the US dollar rising and then oil prices. Oil is the most important commodity in the world, despite what uh, Justin Trudeau and Freeland might think. And if you, and if you rise and if the, the cost of the most important commodity in the world rises, it's sort of like raising interest rates. So if you know, think kind of like philosophically. So you got two very, very important kind of policy levers that are frankly out of the control of, of governments. And so that's makes it quite dangerous as far as risk assets are concerned in the shorter term. Keith, you were, uh, you and I were talking a little bit off, off the, off the record here, off the show. Um, but sort of my, my rebuttal to you is basically, okay, so you've got this rising U S dollar. I mean, does that not do, does that not do the job or the trick, uh, in terms of quelling, you know, inflation, uh, because it's, they, they call it the, the dollar, you know, the wrecking ball. Right. Um, so you got this rising U S dollar. Does that not sort of quell inflation creates, you know, a sell-off and risk assets, it almost does the job of the central bank where like you almost don't have to raise interest rates because you got this strengthening us dollar. That's, you know, going to crush everything anyways. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It's good for the Americans, of course, but for outside of as Rich just said, for the emerging market world, um, it, it's, it, it's not a good, you know, it's, it's not a good blend. So, uh, you know, again, with the federal reserve down in the U S if they, I mean, they, they've said, Hey, we're going to use a stronger dollar. That's what we're going to go with here. Uh, and there's also discussions, uh, that, that I'm hearing is that, so right now the, the, the federal reserve and, and the U S treasury, so you have Powell versus Yellen, uh, they're, they're butting heads ag aggressively. So, uh, Yellen, you know, wants to spend, 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 you know, champion all, all of these new, new social projects, whereas Powell is saying, <laughs> that ain't what we do here at, at the Federal Reserve. Uh, so, you know, they're hitting each other over their head. And uh, Powell is, is losing this, this fight, so to speak, you know, with, with Raynard being appointed uh, as his, basically as his, the, the new leader. Keith, it's also after it, having to leave. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so go ahead. No, I was going to say, it's also because the world's connected, right? We often think of these like individual countries as silos, but the U.S. is... Yes, it's the U.S. Fed and yes, it's the U.S. economy, but, you know, um, it's the U.S. is the Federal Reserve of the world and um, and the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. And, you know, the, the world's in, outside of the U.S. is in flames. It's very, very, very hard for U.S. risk assets to do well, you know. Um, I yeah, because you remember, it, I'm sorry, but you remember like no, no, Powell, was trying, Powell was trying to raise rates back in, was it 16? I think I, I get the years mixed up now. Uh, and he was going like, you know, a quarter point here and then another quarter point. And it was just slowly just sucking the life out of the world. Yeah. And uh, he kept going and going until he just he couldn't go anymore. So I, I wrote a piece at the time and then I sort of, you know, mocked what Powell's desk was like that morning. You know, picture the again, I'm a booner. You guys remember the show Get Smart, I imagine. No, I think I think so. Is that the guy with the phone in his shoe? Yeah, it was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, you know, based on Inspector Gadget sort of. Anyway, like to picture a big telephone with all these different, each number was a red line hotline to another central bank and they were all lighting up. And, you know, the perspective what was happening back then, you know, the Canadians are calling and said, man, you got to stop raising rates. You're killing us up here. Give it up. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, we need to do it. And he goes, oh, wait, I got another call. And Bank of England is calling. And 
you know, they're saying, please stop raising rates. It, it, you're, you're, you're stifling our economy. And all of a sudden he goes, oh, wait, I got the Germans on line four. You know, everyone is saying the exact same thing. And then before you knew it, yeah, we had, we had a crisis starting to develop in the emerging market world. And Powell and the Federal Reserve, they had to immediately backtrack raising rates. And, and that's where, again, I talk about like easy turning points. That's where we're headed now. And it, it happens quickly. It happens very quickly. And, you know, we have Turkey, of course, we talked about Turkey last week or the week before, I don't, I don't remember. Uh, so Turkey was a turning point. We, we've been talking about it now for about two years here with, with ICECAP. And uh, again, it, it's a turning point. You could clearly see it was going to hit. And it's taken about 18 months for it to develop. And again, what's real interesting with it developing now is that the rest of the world has moved out of sync and that is no longer this, hey, full on, let, let's, let's party on and have fun. You know, central banks being hawkish again, all this fiscal stimulus is rolling over. So it, it, Turkey is at this dangerous moment in time where it can absolutely cause contagion to other markets. And, and one of the key, maybe this is one of the charts you can show, Rich, uh, you, you can show credit spreads, how they're widening. Um, so for everyone, a credit spread is the difference in borrowing rates between the government and a low quality borrower. So the difference between the two is the spread. Uh, you, you can also look at, you know, there's a couple of ETFs. One is HYG, which shows the US junk bond market. And the other one is uh, EMB, which shows the emerging market uh, bond market. And, and both of those have been selling off now over the last four weeks. So, the, and remember, in, so in, in the investment world, everyone knows this, if they don't know it, then probably want to speak with a new manager <laughs> credit leads equities that that's the way financial markets work so credit markets have started to sell off now over the over the last few weeks turkey is popping up again like we're heading and I, I think we're heading this really good opportunity coming up to uh either preserve gains that people have or even to make money on, on the other side here but again it's, I, it's all transparent can we can see it all yeah, Can I just shoot. give some just the listeners like, some just perspective when you say Turkey's in trouble? I just want to let you know. So two years ago, roughly, it took six Turkish lira to buy one US dollar. Okay. And now, roughly speaking, let's say plus or minus a little bit, it's about 12 or 13 Turkish lira to buy one US dollar. So and, and that shift from so it took, as Keith said, it took a long time to sort of shake out. But just in the last three months, it's gone from eight to like 12 or 13. So it's like a 30 or 40 percent decline in your currency. Just so it's just people. Not everybody may know what's going on there, but it's just an absolute. It's, it looks like a cliff. It looks like if you show the chart, it looks like an absolute. So it looks like a waterfall, like Niagara Falls. But anyway, sorry. We'll, we'll probably yeah, post sure. that chart there. But Keith, I have yeah. a question now. So you, obviously, I'm going to bring this back to you because I'm sure there's going to be a whole bunch of people watching, listening to the show going, OK, stronger U.S. dollar you know, sell off and in, in, in risk assets. What does this mean for Canadians here up north? What's 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 your prognosis? So like if you're Lawrence Shembri there shaking in your boots, what are you doing? So what what this does, if we get a, a sell off at risky assets, risky assets means the equity markets that that's what you're looking at here. And, and currencies coming down. That will then give all central banks, including the Bank of Canada, the, the opportunity to not raise rates. So remember, remember how we were talking there a few weeks ago? I think it was uh, uh, Scotia Bank said they, were, they thought they might get eight rate hikes. And I think we all sort of said, well, they might get two in and they get stopped out. Uh, they, they might get stopped out before they do any. So that, that's what this kind of event will do for it. As for Canadians, uh, I mean, if, if oil shoots up, it, it should provide some cover for the Canadian dollar, you know, relative to, you know, Euro, Aussie, Sterling and, and stuff like that. But it, it will come down versus the US dollar. That, that's a lot of moving pieces. Happening. And Keith, Keith, I love it. I, and I, I definitely agree with you because it's, Again, we, we had some jokes there. It was Scotia with eight hikes and CIBC more recently said six. But uh, again, I feel like these, I don't know, God bless these, some of these economists, I just feel like they don't, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I feel like they don't really look at like financial markets. 
<laughs> there's there's another um just to, to add it's a little bit more color to for the canadian sort of investor or people so canada's um equity markets um is dominated by two sectors um financials and specifically banks specifically six banks and then the other big chunk so that's about 30 or 40 percent depending on the week and then the other big chunk is oil and the other the problem with owning all these banks um, I think that they're relatively profitable. Everybody knows they pay ridiculous fees, so they're not exactly going to go bankrupt. We can argue about that. You know, who knows? But what I do know is that they're, they, they fluctuate with interest rates. Um, and, and so, you know, that's why partly why Canada's equity market has done so, so well as a function of it's dominated by banks. And when the 10-year bond yield, for example, goes up, banks outperform. Um, and so the, the opposite is true. If you have a situation where um, interest uh, spreads blow out and people are worried about growth again, um, for the reasons that Keith so eloquently laid out, you have a situation where the banks in Canada will almost certainly track down with those bond yields. And so it's very, very difficult for the Canadian equity market, um, which is again dominated by banks, to do well in that environment. Um, and just to reiterate it as well. Um... You know, I, I'm I'm not expecting this washout in in markets. So, you know, please don't run out and sell everything you you own and stuff like that. You know, in terms of a uh, you know a pullback, it, it could be ten percent, twelve percent, eight percent, or twenty. Who who knows? But again, the risk with markets with the capital markets today, it, it's in the bond world. It, it's not in the equity world. The equity world will express itself first. But once things, you know, once they figure things out, you know, then it will be the bond market that's trouble. The, the, the real challenge with Canadian banks, of course, because they're so large, you know, they, they dominate Canadian stock markets, and most Canadians have held them directly or indirectly for a long time. And you know, you know, we've all made a lot of money off, off these bank stocks. Um, if for some reason the housing market in Canada did come off. Um, that that is incredibly bearish for Canadian banks because they their their loan portfolios are are all stuffed, you know, with Canadian housing markets directly, and then you have indirect effects with them as well because of all the spin off and in the employment sector and and so forth. So um, you know, anyone who's who's concerned about the, uh, the housing market in, in Canada, you have to be worried about the uh, you know the banks. You know what. Uh, you know, one of my friends down in Australia, he, he was starting up a fund a couple of years ago to, to basically short the Australian market. And he, it was, a lot of it was the same features or characteristics that, that we have up here in Canada. And uh, so he's going to short the bank, short credit and, you know, all these different things. And, and he wasn't able to raise enough money for it in, in the end to, to get it off the ground. But, but I, I share that as an example Again, because we're at these big turning points in in the markets and in the world, where you know these opportunities are there, uh, and even though, so, so say say uh, say my friend say he you know, maybe, maybe he's off by three years, but I think he will be right in the end. But if again, if you're able to get capital lined up stuff like that, like there there are some really good opportunities here. And so right now, if you say you open a fund in Canada, call it the Canadian Bear Fund or whatever you know, you're shorting Canada. It's, it's most Canadians won't put money in that fund because, you know, they, they don't believe the story. It's hard to do. Foreign investors are going to look at it and say, well, I got, you know what, I'm going to put my money elsewhere anyway. But, but again, the, you know, market conditions are there for these big turning points coming up. And I think they're Actually, easy to Keith, see. I think the, just one last, sorry, Steve, I just want to say, it's also difficult when you have central bankers profoundly devaluing currency so a lot of these shorts are in nominal terms right and you know you like another example is you know guess what's the best performing equity market um, month to date in the world by far it's the bist 100 it's the turkish it's a turkish stock market and it's up almost 23 24 percent and so this is this is the issue and i think it brings us home hopefully steve can give us some color on this but on how you know we're about we're renewing what is it the five year uh, contract with the the Canada and the Bank of Canada, and they may or may not change the language and the scope of the Bank of Canada mandate. And if you start and if and so maybe Steve, you I can pass to you and you can tell us more about it. But you know when you start getting central banks messing with that fiat, messing with that currency, it's very very hard to 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 short um, those assets that are rising because the value of 
the currency's falling. I mean, that was, that was kind of my thoughts hearing Keith go on about the, the, uh, the guy trying to short the Aussie, you know, sort of housing market banking sector. It was just like, I agree. I mean, if you look at Aussie Canada, you're like, Oh my God, these like, this thing's got to blow at some point, but it's like, you're basically betting it against an entire nation that's willing to print into oblivion uh, before they let this thing blow. And again, I still think eventually something will happen, but uh, yes, but you know, rich, rich brought up, you know, a good point is I think good way to sort of maybe wrap, wrap up the podcast here, but, I would love to sort of touch on sort of the last bits here of kind of coming full circle. You know, we talked about the bank of Canada blaming investors. Um, You know, we talked about Brainerd and the fed there. Uh, We've got an update here in Canada as well. So part of this whole thesis, right? Like look at the housing market, et cetera. So the bank of Canada is set to renew their, their, their um, monetary policy framework. So every five years, that monetary policy framework gets updated. Uh, basically, the Bank of Canada's sole mandate is an inflation target. Um, I think it's between two to three percent. Is there one to three? One to three. So basically two. Basically two. Um, but now Wait, they're coming you, up for. What, what did you say? One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That was a good dad know. joke, Keith. You're getting I better. Don't know if, I don't know if anyone at the Bank of Canada can count, but uh, <laughs> they, uh, so that's, this mandate, most importantly, is this mandate is going to be set by the finance minister, Krista Freeland. And I wrote a, a note like a week or two ago in my newsletter there that Krista Freeland isn't really known to be frugal. I mean, she was basically brought in because Bill Morneau, didn't want to, it wasn't in support of Trudeau's uh, massive budget deficits. And so they brought her in and she's kind of this new face, probably similar to Janet Yellen in the U S that says, listen, we've got all these social programs we got, you know, we want to have free daycare in Canada and we want to have affordable housing, social housing, you know, no person left out of the labor force and she wants to spend into oblivion. And so I have to think like, you know, the, the rumor going around it, on this uh, updated framework is going to be, okay, you're going to have an inflation averaging similar to the Fed. So just because it runs up to 4% doesn't mean you have to hike interest rates right away. You're probably going to have um, a full employment mandate. And then of course, I think the big one is like every other central bank seems to be going, you're going to have this climate change uh, policy, which is kind of vague and kind of, odd that you know central bank's job now is to fight climate change um but that's kind of where we're going it's kind of gives like air cover for basically governments to spend right you can spend on all these massive infrastructure programs and say well it's for the good of climate change and if you don't agree with that i mean you're what kind of a moral person are you if it was if it was infrastructure i think a lot of us would be on board but i think when it when push comes to shove it, it won't be um, I think what's, the, what's I your think view so, on that? Well, I just think it's, I think it's extremely, I, th- let's just put it this way. One of the most, the driving force in my view of inequality in this country and all, a lot of the Western world is not income inequality, it's asset inequality. And the way that you exacerbate that is by number one, keeping interest rates below or below zero sustained negative real interest rates. My dad used to, my dad's not long, no longer with us. He used to say, you know, with no money, you can't make money, but with a little bit of money, you can make a lot of money. And what he was trying to show, tell me about was leverage and rich people have leverage and rich, rich people can exa- and abuse that leverage. And inflation is the way they do that. Um, because real assets, houses, businesses, land, except um, equities, which are dominated by old rich people are that's what will, will protect you from sustained inflation. And so there's like a sweet, delicious, almost sad irony that, you know, you know, the road to hell was paved in good intentions, right? This idea that you can just pl- print and have huge de- budget deficits in order to sort of help the lower working class people of Canada w- in my view um, and I think my politics are very clear now in episode seven, but um, is that it actually does the total opposite. Um, instead of productivity, 
instead of um, real wages going up, you have the exact opposite. And I think you're exactly right. I think all of these full employment climate stuff just gives cover to actually exacerbate what's what's really plaguing our world, which is people don't want to work when and they can just borrow and invest in real estate. And then that's, it's not sustainable. I just don't know when it's gonna, it's gonna end in tears. Keith? Um, you know what, all, 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 all I can say is, um, and I say this all the time, it's sort of irrelevant what we feel they yeah. should do or they shouldn't do. <laughs> uh, the, the fact is that this is what they are going to do. So I think that creates opportunities like in, in the investment world, um, like carbon credits, that's a market. It's a market, you know, you, you should be looking at to invest in. Yeah. So anyway, I do have to, I got to go back and comment one thing that Rich said a few minutes ago, just, just so that it's not lost out there. Uh, you, you mentioned that the Turkish market was the best performing one to date. That, that's in Turkish lira. Yes, terms. I know. Sorry. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't, want, I didn't want anyone to start running out and, and buying, you know, Turkish equities. In, in U.S. Sorry. dollar, You're right. Canadian dollar terms, it, it hasn't. Uh, no, no. I just want to make sure we get the right. Yeah, we just got the right, the right message out there. That's it. That's turkey a, day. Hey, okay. yeah. Turkey day. I think that's a very important way to end it though. On Turkey days that uh, <laughs> Canadians really have to, in particular is like how you measure your returns, right? Like it's right. like, it's everybody looks at like a nominal terms. Right. But it's like, and I always like to get to come back full circle. I put up these couple charts and, and like, you know, like for example, like, you know, you measure, you measure, you know, Canadian home prices in, in an ounce of gold and like this down it's that uh, has you know it's been it's been trending down for 10 plus years right so it's always about your like your your measure of account and same thing for the for the Turkish lira there um anyways I digress so they, but they will look so they'll have capital controls coming on next and a lot of people say well what the heck is that you we're in Canada like if we ever get capital capital controls in Canada we're screwed it, it, it's <laughs> The Canadian dollar is now at 20 cents. Like that, that's where we're at at that point. But what capital controls means that if your money is in Turkey, you cannot get it out. It, it, it's trapped there in, in the system. And uh, that is, you know, that is the next sign of, of complete distress. Because what happens then if there's capital controls and you cannot get your money out of the country as a foreign investor or as a fiduciary of, of assets for other people, whether it's for individual investment portfolios or, or pension funds, or whatever, you are not going to touch that market with a 10 foot pole. So then that, that country and they starve that they, they need foreign assets to come in. And because they can't get it, you know, that's when inflation starts, you know, that's when the Turkish lira goes to 100. You think going from eight to 12 is big, 12 to 100. Then that's, and that's what, that's what will happen. We get capital you're, controls over there. You're saying the uh, the good people of Turkey should be going long Bitcoin then, and they probably already oh. are. Nigeria <laughs> yeah. has inflation of twenty percent. They're one of the largest adopters of Bitcoin. Yeah, you need go. a way to get your your money out of the system. So um, you know whether it's through crypto or, or through something else. We're, we're making it. we're making a strong case here. Keith Keith Dicker loading up on Bitcoin, <laughs> back in the truck up. <laughs> He just got to figure out how to put the treasure wallet into his computer there. <laughs> we'll be all good. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I think that's, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, even though we're not American. God bless you, Rich. <laughs>